I would like to officially welcome you to Gem A Live and to today's session on the Gems of the UK, which should be a really fun, enjoyable session. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm Julia Griffith from JewelryAdvisor.com, and today we are going to be looking at the various gems and minerals of the UK. So these are beyond the common ones that you may have heard of, the more famous minerals that we have, such as jet and fluorite. Um, I'm also going to talk to you in a bit of detail about those and show you those localities, as well as many other minerals that we have around the UK, such as this one in this picture. This is one of my favorite minerals known as blister copper. It's actually a type of chalcopyrite, um, a stunning specimen there that's held in the Royal Cornwall Museum. Also, I'm going to talk to you about how you can find your own gems, minerals and fossils here in the UK. So if you fancy a staycation and a day trip to one of these places, I can tell you a few tips and tricks to how you can find your own. And certainly if you're abroad and decide to come here on holiday, there is lots of things that can help expand your knowledge and passion within gems and gemology. So to start off, let's have a look at this map here of most of the UK. We are missing Northern Ireland in this map, I do apologise. But you can see, even in this very simple geological map, we have a huge diversity, so huge variation in the type of uh, geology that we have here in the UK, particularly on the west of the country, so Cornwall, Wales and all throughout Scotland, you can see it's almost this line of geology to the west where we have a particularly um, unique and active geological locations. And in these areas, as well as other places as well, we actually have a huge host of different uh, minerals and gems on offer that can be found and are collected and valued the world over. Now, um, some of these can't be collected by just anyone because they are um, now sites of special scientific interest or and geological research. But there are a number of places that you can go and try out some fossicking, which is the act of looking for different gems and minerals. So on this map, there's just a few um, things pinpointed. So in Scotland, we have found diamonds very small ones and non-gem quality, but diamonds are the same. We have found gem quality sapphires and rubies. And we've also found uh, in a number of different places, beryls and topaz, tourmalines, um, agates, so polycrystalline quartz, fluorites in a number of locations as well, as well as some really um, key and unique uh, fossils that we have, as well as fossilized uh, wood, jet and also amber we can find here as well. So uh, I'm mainly familiar with Cornwall which is situated down here and even though just a few things are pinpointed on this map I've added a few more gems that can be found in this area so including malachite and quartz and chrysocolla, hematite and we're going to talk about a number of these stones within this presentation. So to start off, we're going to talk a bit about the history of mining within the UK, because this is really the start of the search for minerals. So we've been searching for different minerals, well, searching for minerals really since the Bronze Age. So the Bronze Age, this was um, a period in time from 3000 to 1200 BC, so four to 5000 years ago. And uh, this was a huge step in the evolution of mankind when we discovered how to make bronze, which is a mixture between tin and copper. Now, where we find this metal is, uh, the metal is actually locked up within metal ore. And by metal ore, we mean uh, mi minerals. So we mean uh, metal elements trapped up within bonds and compounds. So for example, one of the very common minerals that was mined was actually cassiterite. Now this is a tin oxide. And so this was our main source of tin. This would have to be refined, so broken down, and this would give us the tin metal. Now, cassiterite on its own, this can be a gem quality. We can have some fantastic crystal specimens as well. This is a particularly nice twinned crystal, which is housed in the Royal Cornwall Museum. It is from Cornwall as well. And they can also be a gem quality. They can be a nice honey yellow 
and reddish browns, brown, and also purplish colors as well as black. And some say they can look like black diamonds when they're faceted, uh, if they're black, because they've got this very, very high metallic luster. So this was the principal source for tin ore within England. And we were lucky to have any ore of tin at all because tin is an exceptionally rare element within the earth. There's about two parts per million of tin in the earth's crust. Also, um, for comparison, copper is about 70 parts per million and something a bit more common like iron is 50,000 parts per million. So to have any tin at all is very lucky. And it turns out that we had some very large deposits down here in Cornwall where I'm based. And this allowed us to really become a major source uh, of these uh, minerals and the supply of tins and bronze to across the nation as well as internationally as well. So it really kicked off a lot of the mining. Now to look for copper, we have some other types of ore that we need to look for, so such as malachite. This is something you might be familiar with uh, for your gemstones because it makes a gorgeous gemstone, but this is a copper carbonate, so this is copper ore. At the time when this was first found, um, they didn't have mineralogical names or gem names, so this was simply called green copper because for them it was the source of copper. There were some other types of ore as well. So this one was known as red copper, which is cooperite, which is another mineral and sometimes used as a gemstone. Uh, yellow copper, this is chalcopyrite. So another source of copper, so copper iron sulfide. Uh, this is the type of pyrite, but it has a high copper content. There are other types of pyrites as well, a few of which are in this presentation. Uh, blue copper was azurite, so another copper carbonate there, and then grey copper is calcocite. So all these different types of ores, which nowadays would be considered prize mineral specimens, um, at the time this was really their source of uh, metal, so extracting tin, pure tin and copper. Now uh, when it comes to finding minerals, uh, many minerals, including uh, the ones that were searched for and many others, were all found as a byproduct of the mining. Now, um, when they started hun hunting for these minerals, so for cassiterite, let's, as an example, cassiterite has a really high density, so often they could find this in streams and riverbeds, and they would mine this just by hand. Um, as the deposits depleted, they started building trenches and digging a bit deeper. But eventually, as, um, as resources became exhausted, they had to start mining underground and you know, much deeper to obtain this metal ore. And upon digging deeper, they did find uh, an awful lot of other materials, but where they didn't have a use at the time, often a lot of these minerals were put on to spoil heaps, also known as mine dumps or tailings. So a lot of these just ended up being tossed over and are still often there within mine dumps today and can be found still if you go hunting for them. Collecting minerals as specimens didn't really start until, um, or majorly start until the 18th century. Uh, mineral mineralogy became its own principal subject within the 16th century. So this is when uh, there was a lot more interest in studying and naming these materials, seeing the link that these materials have to geology, and also. Um, Ah, but also, beg your pardon, that's never happened to me before, I'm so sorry. But also around the 18th century, this is also the beginning of the first industrial revolution as well. So a lot more mining, a much larger scale mining was able to be possible due to the introduction of steam power at the mines. And due to this, a lot more materials being bought up, so a lot more minerals were being found as well. And so the importance of collecting and treasuring and studying these materials became a lot more apparent. So uh, evidence of mining is clear all across England, particularly in Cornwall. I like to joke that the whole place is one big mine dump because at one point there were thousands of active mines all around this part of the country. And evidence of this is still around today. So what I thought initially were hill hills, uh, as you drive around, there are actually huge mine dumps that you can see all around Cornwall. If you look here, we have engine houses scattering um, all around the various cliffs as well. So these are the areas where the minerals were processed to become pure metal.
So many British materials are collected today. For such a small country, we have a huge diversity of minerals that sometimes are enviable, really, compared to other deposits in the world. And these are collected and transported and traded across the world and can be found in many different museums and very famous collections and private collections as well. Now, some of the most notable gems that we can find in the UK that you've probably heard of are Whitby Jet, Blue John, which is a type of fluorite, Green Fluorite, particularly that from the Rodgley Mine um, up in northern England, Cairngorm, which is actually smoky quartz that can be found in Scotland, and also Serpentine, so Serpentine, which is from here in Cornwall, where I'm based. Now, these are very well known worldwide from, um, from coming from the UK. And the reason for that is a lot of these stones listed here have great properties. They're either excellent examples um, compared to other specimens in the world. Sometimes they're the only known types or variety of that particular gem, or they're known for being of the highest quality. So uh, what we're going to do now is have a look into a bit more detail into some of these stones. And also, I'm going to um, scatter this lecture with different minerals that you can find from nearby areas as well. So we're going to start off with Whitby Jet. So Whitby Jet is fossilized driftwood. And this fossil is exceptionally old. So this is 180 million years old. And uh, this happened when England and, well, all of the countries were in a very different location in the planet. So at the time, England was more towards the equator. And there was a very unique geological situation that happened that had just the right temperature and pressure to pr preserve this driftwood as this fossil that we now know as jet. Now, this is quite unique fossil to have in the first place. There's only a few deposits of jet worldwide. The majority of fossilized wood or fossils of wood that occur elsewhere, um, these are often quartz fossils because the wood is replaced by silica. So it's a pseudomorph of wood. But here, instead, the wood itself has stayed and it's fossilized. And this only happens in a few locations. And the one that's found in Whitby Jet, this is actually the oldest known fossilized wood as well. So it's the first one that's ever found in the geological record, so in the layers of the earth. So this comes from a particular type of species of tree. Originally, it was thought to be monkey puzzle trees. However, so a more recent research from Sarah Steele, who's doing very in-depth research into jet, from, particularly from Whitby, uh, is finding that actually it's a different species of tree altogether. So sit tight for the rest of that research. But Whitby jet is known for its um, unique stability. It's meant to be harder than other jets, which in turn means that it can take a better polish and also a better luster. Um, and also it's meant to be the most pure form of jet as well. So if you broke it in two, in some jets, you might be able to see structures of wood, but here it's very, very dense and very uniform throughout. So considered very pure. And as such, it's considered the finest jet in the world. There is a close second. So a Storian jet is a close second Otherwise, Whitby Jet is often thought as the best. So Whitby Jet was made very famous by uh, Queen Victoria, who very famously wore jet jewellery as part of her mourning dress. So she was in mourning for Prince Albert for over 50 years. And um, with jet, where it's such a lightweight material, the jewelry became exceptionally large. You could have really large beads and intricate designs, but without being uncomfortable or weighing down on the wearer. So jet jewelry became very fashionable throughout the mid to late Victorian era. If we have a look whereabouts we can find Whitby Jet, it is from one very small stretch of coast, just a couple of miles in length. And it's up here near a town called Whitby, where it gets its name from, uh, and that's positioned in North Yorkshire. And we can find this within the mudstone formation, which is the cliffs. So the cliffs that house these fossils are now up on the land. And these slowly er er erode away with time. So with the tides and with rock falls and with general weathering, these um, 
cliffs are eroding away and exposing uh, deposits of jet, so little areas of fossilized wood. So this, we allow this to naturally erode away from the cliffs. We do not dig into the cliffs, that's not allowed. Uh, so it is a very natural process. We wait for natural erosion and then we can go around the beaches and collect the various pieces of jet. So it is a very ethical process, a natural process. And it also means there is only a limited amount of product that is available at any one time. Uh, People that work with JET, so often those in Whitby, um, Jewelers in Whitby, they will also go and collect JET from uh, this coast in the same way. So here are some pieces of JET in jewellery, so some fantastic earrings that I love there, a uh, man's ring, and also this necklace um, pendant by Sarah Still, which is very aptly named the Wit B. So uh, the jet can still be found very commonly in jewellery in more creative ways than the morning jewellery or, you know, different ways to the morning jewellery that we had before. If you want to find your own jet, you can do so. This is an activity known as jetting, and this is the action of beach combing for jet. So here's one of the beaches. You can walk along and have a look for these dark, rounded stones. Well, they look like stones. So uh, the best time to go is when the tide is receding. This is when any more recent jet might be washed up and also gives you lots of time to look around before the tide turns and comes back in. So you're looking for black stones, but when you pick them up, they will have a very light heft. And this is because they have a very low density, so they feel really light for their size. So they have an SG, specific gravity, of 1.2 to 1.3, and that's a similar density, just above that, of amber. So they are very light stones, and that's how you can tell them from your other black pebbles that will be along the coasts of Whitby. Speaking about amber, amber is another stone that you can find on the beaches here in the UK. And this amber is Baltic amber, so the same types of amber that you can find on the coasts of Poland and Russia and some of the other Eastern European countries. So here are the few locations that you can find it within the UK. Uh, one of them is Cromer in Norfolk, which is this central star here. And uh, here is a very popular place to beachcomb for amber. One lady not too long ago, so in 2013, found a huge chunk of Baltic amber here weighing 700 grams on one of her beach coving trips. So that was very nice and successful. Uh, also, you have the Amber Coast positioned in Suffolk, which is just below here. And also we can find it on the Isle of Wight, which is an island just off the south coast down here. Now, the amber here that was found, uh, this was found in the 90s, it was said at the time to be the oldest amber ever found, which was 115 million years old. Now, most amber is 20 to 40 million years old. So if we consider that, then this amber is much, much, much older. Also, we can find it in Ayrshire in um, Scotland. So here it's known as Middle Tonight, and this also claims to be the oldest amber in the world. However, unfortunately, it didn't have any dates on the article I read, so I can't compare the figures here. But the amber that was found here was particularly unique. Um, it did reveal some brand new species um, that we hadn't discovered before in regards to uh, flora. So there was some uh, brand new fungi and flowers and pollen that hadn't been discovered before in this amber. So that was a great um, contribution to um, science. Also, we have the Sussex coast. So here um, we also have found some very interesting inclusions within amber uh, and that they have been claimed to be the oldest spider webs ever found in amber. So these spider webs have been dated to be 140 million years old. So uh, from all these figures, I believe that this amber here found in Sussex is the oldest amber so far at a whopping 140 million years old. When it comes to finding amber, it's very similar to finding jet. You walk slowly along a beach and have a look to see what you can find. Now, the amber that's found at these beaches are often yellow, orange to brown. They can be opaque. So here's a picture. I wonder if you can spot out any amber from this picture. Mm, it is a trick question because that's all amber. So therefore, uh, looking at this, this is what amber can look like. It can look very similar to other pebbles you might find at the beach. 
A few clues though, are one, if it is in the surf, it will probably be floating and moving around quite a lot because it is, again, a very light material with a specific gravity of just 1.1. So when you're searching for amber on the beach, uh, also you can pick it up and you'll feel that it's much lighter than other materials as well. Other things that we can find on the coasts of the UK are fossils. And the best place to find fossils is the Jurassic coast, where we can find ammonites, which are these lovely um, gastropod shells here. This one in particular is pyrotized, so it has been replaced by pyrite. Also belemites, crinoids, uh, other dinosaur fossils um, as well that can all be found on the Jurassic coast. When it comes to looking for fossils, again, it's beach combing, just like you do for amber and jet. The difference is, is the materials here are a lot heavier, so it's very good to come after a storm or some heavy rain that's either washed them away from uh, the cliffs that are here, because this is where all the ammonites are hiding within the cliffs, um, or so that there's been big waves to also bash up and naturally weather away these rocks here, which are mudstones. It's good to go early in the day. I like to beat the crowds and uh, see what you can find before anyone else has a look. But often there's so many little ammonites there, you're sure to come away with one or two pieces. And it's also a very good idea to go when the tide's receding. So you can go and follow the surf as it recedes and see any ammonites that might be revealed. Here is uh, my findings from one of my ammonite hunts. So it was a very successful day. These are all pyrotized ammonites. So it can be great just to walk along and see what you can find. Here's another pyrotized fossil that we once found. This was uh, a great thing that we found. We were really happy when we found this. Um, so this is a smaller segment, but of a much larger ammonite. Uh, it is a pseudomorph, so it has been replaced with pyrite. And you can see here that it's got some amazing patterns on the shell. These are known as sutra lines and are similar to what we have in our skulls. So it fuses, um, fuses the structure together and gives it strength. Also, um, if you're unsuccessful at the beach, there's always local shops around these areas, these tourist areas. So this is the one in Charmouth, which is on Fossil Beach, beg your pardon, which is on the Jurassic Coast. Uh, also, there will be uh, specialised amber shops and jet shops as well in uh, the locations where you can find those materials. And often you can see a huge range of materials here, uh, particularly for these fossils. They were really competitive prices as well. So always good to check out and to take a um, memento from uh, these shops as well. Another place to find fossils, uh, so just a bit north from Jurassic Coast, is Fossil Beach, which is on Watch It in Somerset. So here you can find more ammonites, much larger in size. So I believe these are limestone fossils, but you can collect these huge ammonites there. We managed to find this one after a recent rock fall, and it was just there exposed, ready to be collected. Also in Fossil Beach, we can find amylite as well. So amylite is um, really, it's a type of gem, but it is a type of fossilized ammonite. Uh, the difference here is uh, we don't really know the geological processes which cause it, but um, basically it's a fossilized and preserved part of the shell. It's preserved nacreous layer of the shell. Now, this is quite rare. Um, most of the time, when uh, anything is fossilized with a shell, the whole structure is replaced with calcium carbonate, or an, such as calcite, or another type of material. But in the case of amylite, uh, the structure of the shell, which causes the nacreous layer, so the iridescent colors, remains intact. So um, we're not sure why this happens, but after fossilization, you can have these amazing iridescent colors, which is something that's really special to see. Um, the quality found in England is not as good as the ones found in Alberta, Canada, but you know, the ones in Alberta, Canada are by far the best in the world, but still a really fantastic thing to find. Other fossil localities can be found throughout England, including central England, 
or near London, so Surrey, and also in Wales. And you can find lots of different materials here, so from sea urchins to shark's teeth and other types of shells, so bivalves if it's two shells, or gastropods as shown here. That's a pyrotized gastropod there, but lots of places to find. Moving on to the next gem now, we're going to talk about Blue John. So Blue John is a very unique variety of fluorite. It can only be found in one location within England, and that is just one or two uh, caverns that are situated in Derbyshire, and it's also known as Derbyshire Floor Spa. Now, Blue John, this fluorite is banded. It's a banded variety which consists of purple banding as well as yellow and colourless or white bands and has been used for hundreds of years historically to decorate stately homes um, because it can be so beautifully made into urns and goblets and bowls. Uh, the particular deposit as well of Blue John within Derbyshire did have some deposits large enough to make one whole big carvings out of, which was also really special as well. So the areas where we can find these gems are we're known as the Blue John Cavern and also the Treak Cliff Cavern. These are the only two places that have Blue John that are owned by the same company. Uh, and this can be found in Castleton in Derbyshire. Now, these are currently being actively mined, so uh, you can go and visit the Blue John Cavern and take a tour, but you can't collect from this area because it is a private land and it is being um, mined commercially. Uh, in its heyday, when Blue John was really super popular back in the 1800s, uh, at that time you'd get about 20 tonnes of material out from these mines in the rough, which then uh, was worked into different ornaments and jewellery items. Nowadays, it's much lower in production. You're talking about maybe half a tonne of rough material a year. Uh, so here is, uh, here I am inside Blue John Cavern, trying to show you that it is a cavern because for some reason I wasn't expecting it to be quite so cavernous on the inside. I was wrong and I should have really known from looking at the name. And you can find lots of original veins um, in situ and see where that Blue John fluorite grew. So a really nice tour that you can go and visit. And they have a local shop as well where they sell rough pieces, uh, tiny ornaments and also jewellery as well. So with Blue John jewellery, this is still used today, so to showcase the wonderful bluish purple, white and yellowish bands of the Blue John. Uh, to see some of the larger bowls and things, um, where the material is so limited now, it is very rare and it's from a finite resource. Um, where it's so rare, it normally can only be found in second-hand items and the best place to for me to show you, or the best thing I can show you to show you some of these old ornamental items is this picture here, which is um, the entire collection of Blue John, which was sold at the Blue John auction by Fellows and Sons Auctioneers in 2015. So um, I worked there just before this and I saw them collecting all this Blue John. I wondered what was going on, but I couldn't believe it when they announced a whole catalogue of over 250 job lots, um, all of Blue John fluorite, ranging from jewellery pieces to small bowls to goblets and eggs, some rough pieces as well and candlesticks and other things also. At the back here it's hiding, this was the very last lot to be sold. Uh, this is an urn that was designed by uh, Matthew Bolton, so uh, very famous um, in the 1800s and he's actually been uh, credited for raising um, the reputation of Blue John through his designs and through his work. And that particular urn, I believe, sold for £21,000 hammer price. But almost every single piece sold and most of them sold um, above estimate as well. So a very successful sale. So as I mentioned, you can't go finding your own Blue John yourself because that mine is owned and it's you know, a very specific location for Blue John. However, you can find your own fluorite in other places nearby in Derbyshire. So here is some purple fluorite that we came across in an old quarry. And also uh, you can see some crinoid fossils just situated in the rock also.
Uh, here is a wall of fluorite that's also in the old quarry. So you can see that cubic form for fluorite here. So not something you can necessarily collect and take home. However, if you see mineralization like this, it's a great clue to saying that you're in a spot where you could find something very, very good. Here is a bug um, of calcite and also some fluorite as well. The calcite in this bug has great crystal form. I managed to liberate one and take it home. And also uh, some fluorite crystals also. And here I am with a, a calcite bug as well. So a bug, that's actually a Cornish term for cave. So uh, this is a cave of crystals, if you like. Another material that can be found within uh, the Midlands of England uh, is galena. So galena is a metallic mineral. Um, it oxidizes very quickly and turns off in a dark gray. But when it's just recently exposed, it's this wonderful um, silvery material here. And I managed to find about 30 pieces of this um, just from walking around in an activity which is known as specking. So Specking is when you're walking around and just looking for things with your eyes. You're not moving anything around. And it can be amazing what you can find because where this, I believe this might have been from a rock fall. A rock might have fallen and broken and liberated all these Galena crystals. And then you can come, you know, come across just looking and you suddenly find all of these specimens just there, liberated, available uh, to touch and to collect. So really, really wonderful. Uh, specking is also really good from around all sorts of um, mine dumps as well, because especially after rain, um, the rain washes away all the light material and leaves heavier material on top. So it's a natural weathering process which might reveal all these minerals to you. No digging required. You can just find some really good specimens through specking. Moving up the country now to northern England, this is another amazing place to find lots of different types of fluorite. So here we have this gorgeous uh, green and blue fluorite from Durham. We have some purple fluorite here with some chalcopyrite crystals on one side. And also some green fluorite here, interpenetrant twin fluorite, which again is all from Weardale in Durham. We can get lots of other colours too, well, including banded fluorite and yellows. But the best way to show you really is to show you this picture here, which is a very fine collection of faceted fluorites, which are from all sorts of locations um, across northern England. And these fluorites are part of the Lindsay Greenbank collection and really showcase the uh, variety of fluorites that we can find here and of high gem quality. The mine that's best known for fluorites in more recent years will be the Rogerley mine, which is in County Durham. Now, this mine uh, was commercially mined back in the 1970s. Then they took a bit of a lull, but then lots of mining kicked up again in the 90s, all the way until 2017, when they unfortunately announced the closure of the mine. However, I believe the new owners have opened the mine and they are mining again or will be mining again. And this fluorite is renowned worldwide because of its amazing colours and crystal forms. So this here is a picture. This is by Elaine, who spoke to us earlier. So Elaine found this amazing specimen of fluorite. So uh, this is green in colour, but this fluorite exhibits such a strong blue fluorescence that in daylight it appears this really intense blue colour. So you can see this mixture of green and then the blue, which is actually the fluorescence of the fluorite. So this particular type of fluorite from this location is very desirable the world over. You can find it in lots of different collections. Here's a piece that we saw in the Natural History Museum in London, showcasing that lovely green colour. So this is really showing you body colour without fluorescence. I found a similar block of this actually just walking around the streets of New York in a mineral shop. There was one of these on sale um, and that was being sold. I think it was it sold for just under $10,000 and it was all from the Rogerly mine in um, Durham. Here we have some fluorites. So again, these are faceted. So these are again from the Rogerly mine. So showing this lovely green coloration here, this is an incandescent light. And then here it is under daylight. So having the green and then the blue due to fluorescence. 
Now, these pictures were taken from the latest publication of the Journal of Gemology, and this was released only yesterday electronically. So if you're a member of GEMA, you'll see in the GEM notes there are two articles on this fluorite from this locality, the Rogerley Mine in County Durham. Other minerals that can be found in Northern England, so these are not uh, gems, they can't be worn in jewellery, but my gosh, they're beautiful. Uh, we have hemimorphite here from Cumbria. Here we have pink calcite, again from Cumbria as well. Both of these showing a gorgeous botryoidal habit. And then at the very end, we have pyromorphite, this lovely green crystal, again from Cumbria. So lots of different minerals to be found. Moving further up now, we're going to enter Scotland and we're going to discuss Cairngorm quartz, or sometimes just referred to as Cairngorm. Now, this is smoky quartz that can be found uh, quite traditionally in the mountains here, which is the mountain range known as the Cairngorms. Uh, and this material is known as the National Gemstone of Scotland. So it's found in the Cairngorms mountain range and often it's faceted, it can be very large and very clear material and it's used in traditional jewellery used for highland dress. So for example, um, here's a pin. They can also be found in other um, pins and brooches as well. But this one, you can see this, I believe the central stone here is about 10 carats of this smoky quartz or this Cairngorm quartz. Uh, it's a gorgeous, large, eye clean material. Also, if we're in Scotland and also if we're talking about Scottish jewellery, we can't ignore the Scottish agates. So Scottish agate, which is a type of polycrystalline quartz, often a banded variety, this can be found from all over Scotland, but there are three notable localities which are said to, to produce uh, the most beautiful kinds. And these three brooches display all the different kinds uh, beautifully. So all the different colours and types of banding that we can see from a variety of these sources in Scotland. I just wanted to highlight uh, this particular piece, which we found uh, online. So um, we didn't find it ourselves, unfortunately, could you imagine? But this is a gorgeous blue agate, which is showing you an incredible structure. So a stalactite structure on the inside. So a really, truly beautiful specimen here, again, from Scotland, from Fife, which is one of the locations I just mentioned before. Uh, also, here are some other Scottish agates that are that you can find potentially. Uh, this colour here at the end, this band of uh, white and orange and red is typically what I associate with Scottish agate, but it can come in a huge variety of colours and patterns. And this is shown quite wonderfully within this book, which is called Scottish agates, so dedicated purely to this stone. Um, and this, there was only about a thousand copies printed so um, I believe they're all sold out, but you might be able to get one on the second-hand market if this is of particular interest to you. Uh, other gems in Scotland, we actually have a huge variety of different minerals found in Scotland. Um, it's noted for garnets, so these lovely ruby red garnets that can be found on the beach. Uh, the beach that they're found on is known as Ruby Bay due to these garnets being there. And on the beach, you can see all these outcrops of igneous rock. And it's from this rock that the garnets are eroded away from. So you can just have a look in the sand, uh, and you, especially where um, you can see the eroded igneous rock where it's darker, you can come across all of these tiny bright red crystals. Also, uh, it's known for gem quality uh, topaz, so colourless as well as blue, which is fantastic. So you can have this um, wonderful colour, natural coloured topaz here. Uh, beryl, tourmaline, lots of different colours of albite tourmaline. So I've seen blue ones from here as well as bicoloured varieties as well. Malachites, as shown in this brooch as well, and also amethyst. Amethyst can be found all across Scotland, but there are a few key localities which show even nicer specimens. We also have prenite, which is a translucent green material. Uh, freshwater pearls can be found within the rivers of a number of different hues, so browns and creams and silvers and some pink tones. Uh, also, a couple of small diamonds have been found and zircons, and also you can go panning for gold within their rivers as well. 
One gem that I just want to focus on a little bit more for Scotland is sapphire. So just a small deposit of sapphire was found within the 90s and this was mined for a short period of time. Now it is an area of um, or a site of special scientific interest. So now no mining takes place on here and it's being researched for geology and mineralogy. Uh, but this is on the Isle of Lewis, so all the way up here and from this location they did manage to find some gem quality sapphires in which case they well they cut a suite of 80 different stones so um, these varied in size from about 30 points all the way up to the largest one which was just under 11 carats so here are a few here so showing you a lovely blue tone a green tone and a bluish green tone here which was the largest specimen at 10.91 carats and there were 80 stones faceted in total. I think a few of them are still for sale. Um, so if you're ever interested, I believe on this website, they might be able to help you. And now the last stone that we're going to talk about in detail is serpentine. And serpentine can be found around the world, but most often serpentine is found as the variety bowenite. And bowenite is a translucent green material. From England, there we have a very unique type of serpentine or serpentine. It's a mixture of different types of serpentine rocks, and they can be found in just one locality, which is the Lizard Peninsula within Cornwall, so located all the way down here. Now, a serpentine or serpentine from the Lizard Peninsula uh, it's actually only there due to a very, very rare geological event. Um, the geology down in the Lizard Peninsula is very unique. There's only a few locations like it around the world. And here, um, what it is, it's actually a oceanic crust, which has been upthrust onto the continental crust. So it's the only place really in the world, or one of the only places that you can walk on oceanic crust without getting your feet wet. So very, very unique in its geology. Again, it was when England was in a completely different part of the world, so near the equator, about 375 million years ago, there was this upthrust of continent, um, beg your pardon, upthrust of oceanic crust and also upper mantle crust, and this metamorphosized from peridotite and pyroxene rocks into a various number of different serpentine rocks. And this is what we have here now on display at the Lizard Peninsula. So here, the serpentine has a huge variety of textures and colours. So um, often when we cut it, it can be called serpentine marble because at one point it was on the market competing with some of the finest marbles in the world. And it can be dark green, uh, yellowish greens, black, red, and also can be streaked with other materials such as hematite and goethite or white steatite as well. So here we've got a few pictures. This is the same piece, just from two different angles, showing you the lovely green areas as well as the black and red. And then here, this is a more fibrous type of serpentine. Um, this is chrysotile, I believe. Um, but it all makes up the various rocks at the Lizard Peninsula. Now, lots of different items are made out of serpentine. Uh, serpentine. Mostly, these were ornamental items. So again, could be fonts or vases fireplaces or mantelpieces, banisters, pillars, inlays, um, urns, all sorts of different materials and um, products were made. And they again were on display in stately homes across the UK and across the world. It became exceptionally popular. Uh, the material became particularly popular because it was exhibited at the Great Exhibition in 1851. So, um, Yes, so Prince Albert and Queen Victoria. And here, these are two pieces of serpentine which were on display at the Great Exhibition. Uh, these are both just under 13 feet foot in height, so 12 foot, 11 inches. And these were the serpentine pieces that were displayed at the Great Exhibition. So here's actually an original clipping um, from the Great Exhibition showing them there. Now these two pieces, they were recently auctioned actually in 2010 at Christie's and they realized a hammer price of over 67,000 pounds. 
Other pieces of serpentine can be found throughout the UK and the world. Um, in the UK, there are pieces within Osborne House, so Queen Victoria's Summer House on the Isle of Wight, Westminster Abbey, and also Chatsworth House as well as many, many other great houses. Uh, here, we actually have a picture of the hallway of the Museum Building and Geology Department of Trinity College Dublin. And we have lots of different serpentine and also Irish marble pillars on display here. And also, if you look here, a serpentine banister running all the way up as well. So a gorgeous display of this material. You can also find pillars within the Natural History Museum of London made out of this material. So at one point it was very desirable, very, very famous and popular. Nowadays you can find pieces around, so still ornamental pieces to purchase. Here's a font here, um, really displaying why it is called serpentine, which is sometimes um, said to mean serpent rock because it looks like snake or lizard skin. It's a great example of that there. And then also we have these pieces of jewellery as well, serpentine jewellery, also with jet here. And there's a great article if you did want to read more by Sarah Steele, which was in the Gem A Gems and Jewellery magazine uh, back in early 2016, if you'd like to find out more. If you'd like to go and see some serpentine yourself, you can. There is some um, well, all over the Lizard Peninsula, they can go walk around all the serpentine rocks. Uh, one great place to go and see it is at a location called Kynance Cove. Uh, this is owned by the National Trust, so you can't collect anything here because it's for everyone to enjoy. However, um, when you go there and have a look, all the cliffs and pebbles are made out of this material. So if you look onto the cliffs, you can see all of these red and uh, black and green serpentines in the rock. And this is beautiful against the golden sands there. So it really is like being in another world when you go and visit this area. You can go and find your own in other areas of the Lizard Peninsula, for example, in old quarries, if, uh, if it's allowed, also along beaches and also recent cliff falls. So here we are actually on a recent cliff fall, just collecting one or two attractive pieces. This was my favourite from the day that I found. So I um, took this home with me. It was my birthday. So this is my birthday present to myself, but a gorgeous piece of serpentine material, which apparently is really beautiful to cut. It's a really nice material to work with. So I intend to do that as well. Uh, if you are wondering why we have a gold detector, it's because we were hoping to also find some native copper whilst we were down there. So something else that we thought we could give a go. Other gems uh, around Cornwall and Devon, so Devon being uh, the county just next to Cornwall, so South West England, uh, we can find many, many gems. So many, so spinel, sapphire, rock crystal quartz, which apparently was of such high um, quality and clear for clarity that they were referring to it as bastard diamonds back in the day because it could be potentially confused with diamonds. Not if you know your crystal systems, but still very clear quartz. We can also find other quartz varieties such as smoky quartz and amethyst and agate. Uh, and then our copper materials as well. So as you're right, the blue we saw right at the beginning, malachite, cassiterite we saw at the beginning as well. As well as some really unique varieties, uh, banded cassiterite only really found here, which is also known as wood tin, can be great to work and used as an ornamental material, as well as lots of other things as well. So small topazes, beryls, tourmalines, particularly shawl down here, turquoise jaspers. Some opal can be found here, but that is, um, it's not precious, opal that shows play of colour, it's normally white common opal, and also garnets, apatite, and rhodochrosite, and quite large pieces of rhodonite can be found down here as well. So here is a lovely crystal specimen, this is calc um, calcopyrite, so a type of pyrite but containing copper, so originally used as a copper ore, uh, and this is also known as peacock ore because when it oxidizes, it has these gorgeous iridescent colors on the surface of the calcopyrite. And this is on a dolomite and quartz matrix. We can also have, um, as well as just specimens, we can have gem quality uh, objects as well. So this is faceted fluorite, so a lovely light blue color from a mine down here in Cornwall also. 
There are also lots of different minerals that can be found throughout Cornwall and Devon. So we've got a few here. So other types of pyrite, arsenopyrite, which is pyrite with an arsenic content, often silvery in colour, chalcopyrite, which is the golden, bornite, beryls, scorodites, pharmacosiderites, and other things as well. A couple of the rarer materials that I'd like to show you and talk to you about here on uh, the middle side, so the left side, uh, this is laroconite. This is a very rare material that's only found in a few deposits worldwide and often very, very small in size. Now this crystal here, which is a good inch in size, I think it's just over an inch, uh, this is the largest laroconite crystal ever found in the world and it was found here in Cornwall. Here is another very rare material as well. This is known as batalakite and is named after um, the area that it was first found, which is the Batalic Mine here in Cornwall. This is a very beautiful, met almost metallic lusted mineral, occurs in tiny, tiny crystals, uh, which grow when, um, well, mineralization comes into contact with seawater, these crystals can grow from that. Uh, very rare, very fragile, you can't touch it, they crumple into glitter, but very desirable the world over because it's said that the best vitalikite comes from Cornwall with the best crystals. And this picture here, um, a recent deposit was found actually by my partner, he found several of these rocks with these really good crystals on it. So a really lovely chance to see something that's very, very rare. Also around um, England, but particularly a very famous location was the Hope's Nose in Torquay in Devon, so next to Cornwall, uh, we could find some native gold. And this is a particularly beautiful example showing these fern-like structures in this native gold here. So very, very lovely. Just to give a shout out to a few other localities, um, Wales, it's known more for its copper minerals and also it's um, gold, so you can go and hunt for gold there. Particularly, they found one nugget that was 97 grams in 2012, reported in 2016. However, that was actually from a shipwreck offshore. But still, uh, we can also find some other materials in Wales as well. This is a particularly beautiful fluorite showing some amazing colour zoning uh, of this lovely purpley blue and then colourless overgrowth on top. Also, Northern Ireland, not particularly known for minerals, but it has produced some beautiful examples. For example, this very rare form of fluorite, uh, rather than being in cubes, as fluorite normally grows in, uh, this is showing you some octahedral fluorite, so fluorite that's grown as octahedrons. Very, very rare form to find them as this in their primary crystal form. And also here's a gorgeous beryl crystal from Northern Ireland as well, so a lovely deep aquamarine. To finish off, I'm just going to give you some tips for if you did want to start out fossicking and looking for some gems and minerals yourself. Uh, first tips really, uh, first thing to do is to head out to a location. So for example, beaches, great place to start to see if you can find anything. Uh, mine dumps and also quarries and if you're feeling adventurous into rivers and seeing what you can find and seeing if you can identify what could be a mineral and a gem and what is just country rock great place to start now uh, you start by something you start by just successfully finding something and it could be anything but as long as you realize that it's different to the rocks around it you're off to a good start and then you start getting your eye in and then you start realizing what triggers to look for and what gems look like and it all comes with experience so in these pictures here these are great clues if you've got anything transparent then straight away you know it's something that's um crystalline um, most often crystalline and something that's um, a bit more than just the average stone. But these are some fluorites that I found just in a mine dump. So nothing special, but a great thing to realize that you're collecting, try and identify it, which we managed to identify it as fluorite. Some of these have lovely green colors as well. Here we have some quartz, not the best quality. However, you can see some wonderful um, pyramidal form forms. So six-sided pyramids, so letting us know that it is quartz. And then here, 
I don't know if you can tell in this photograph, but around this side and also on the top here, we have pyrite, so a lovely metallic mineral. So that's wonderful to find. You can find it again, just looking around for it, looking for these uh, reflective minerals. And um, I always love finding pyrite because I think it really does. It looks like gold, really. That's why it's probably known as fool's gold. But an extra note for when you are collecting materials, uh, we do have to be responsible with our collecting, mainly because um, even though at one point England and especially Cornwall, uh, you know, is a huge mining area, nowadays it's not. So any of the mining dumps that are there, although at the moment there's many and they are very large, um, this is a finite resource and it's also of huge geological importance for research and also um, understanding of different minerals. So it's great fun to go and see these things in situ, identify them. But when you're collecting, the general rule is, and this is a global rule, is that you don't take any more than you need. So if you're only going to go home and put it in a box, you know, maybe leave it. So just take home the ones that you really like and that you will um, use and appreciate. So uh, to talk about finding minerals, I'm sure you'd like to know how you know where to go and look for them. So the key thing for knowing where to go is to do research. And often this requires lots and lots of research of where you want to go and then what you can find there and also what these things look like, what indications there are and how you can identify them. So that once you're there, you know what you're looking for and how to spot it. So different resources, which I can recommend, um, online resources, such as Mindat or Gemdat. Uh, these are websites. Mindat is a mineral database. It has gemstones as well. Uh, gem Gemdat is just gemstones, but they work on a similar basis where they have um, lots of scientific, gemological, geological information on the stones. And also people upload pictures of specimens that they've come across. So there is a huge photographic reference for different materials that give you exact locations. So this can be really, really handy to know what you can find where. Other research you can do comes from articles, um, such as the one I mentioned earlier on serpentine. There's also one, another one in Gems and Jewelry that was written by Callie Oldershaw, which is on how to find agates. Um, on the beaches in Cornwall. So articles can also inspire you. Uh, other books, also blogs, so online blogs, and also British Geological Survey reports can also be good resources of information as well. Something that I like to do, I do like to have a look on social media and search different people's hashtags. So you can search for different hashtags such as fossicking, or gem hunting, rock hounding, and see what comes up, or even for location, Cornish minerals, and see uh, who's about and if they are actively looking for things. This is a great way of finding out, again, different specimens from different locations. And also, um, sometimes they let you know the location of where they've been as well. But that's not so common, because sometimes if people have areas they like to mine, they like to you know, mine in peace which is fair enough. And also there's various forums as well that also people discuss their experiences with as well. There are a few associations in England. Uh, one of them is known as the Russell Society. So this is for um, serious mineral collectors uh, and it's done on an application basis if you want to join, but they do have some trips that they go on once or twice or three times a year to various places so they can go and find different minerals. Uh, when it comes to fossicking, there are a few places where you cannot fossick. It's always best uh, to look out for any signs that tell you that you shouldn't be there. And also in your research, this you know should pull up as well. But we do not trust um, fossick on anywhere that is owned by National Trust. Uh, also, any sites of special scientific interest, we cannot collect from these areas. And also, it goes without saying, but anything that's privately owned, we can also not collect from unless we have explicit permission from the owner. And the other thing that's good to do, um, to look into before you head out, is it is good to find out when the best times to go are. So for example, this might be due to tide times. You might have to go at a certain time and be back by a certain time. You also might want to avoid tourist seasons. So for example, I quite like going to some places in spring and autumn. 
so try and avoid winter um try and avoid summer also uh, it can be good like i mentioned earlier to go after storms or heavy rain because this can leave different minerals lying on the surface ready to be collected uh, just to give a note to different tools and pieces of equipment that you can consider getting, um, sometimes you need nothing but your eyes and a pair of good walking boots. Uh, suitable footwear is key. So that will vary depending on your location. If you're at a sandy beach, you probably won't need any shoes. But otherwise, walking boots are very, very important. Also, you Gloves I highly recommend, especially if you're scrambling through rocks and over dumps and things, it can help protect your hands. Also goggles, particularly if you are into smashing rocks, goggles are of utmost importance because little bits of stone can fly all around. And they also want to take a bag and some plastic baggies, plastic baggies to put in any small materials that you find so that you don't lose them in your larger collecting bag. Also, you'll need something potentially to bash open rocks with. In this case, you do buy a specialized rock hammer. This is similar to a normal hammer. However, the weight's distributed slightly differently. And at the back, it is a point like a pick. This is excellent for smashing open rocks. Uh, brick hammers are OK as well. These have a flat back to them and are also quite good at splitting rocks. I do recommend a particular brand here, so a brand known as Estwing. Uh, I do have one of these hammers, which is seen, through, which has done very, very well, considering it's had a bit of a hard life. Um, and the reason I recommend a particular brand is because I had a bit of a bad experience recently with a cheaper brand, um, which unfortunately I didn't pay the price for. Uh, so this cost me about £23 and I gave this as a gift to my partner. And the first time he used it, you can see there are parts of this hammer that are missing. And unfortunately, uh, one bit splintered off and went into his hand. So here you go. Here's the metal that is permanently within his finger. So this ended up being the gift that keeps on giving for life because it's now with him forever. So, um, yes, this hammer it was £23. I didn't think that was cheap. But unfortunately, the steel was not suitable for hammering at rocks. Other things you might want are uh, picks, chisels, crowbars for moving big boulders, if that's something you might want to do. Rakes, trowels or spades. Um, rakes are particularly good if you want to just move fine rocks away from the surface without using your hands. Little gardening rakes can be perfect for that. Uh, a note to say that if you are ever metal detecting, you'll want to have plastic um, tools instead so that you can still use them with your metal detector, so a plastic trowel to dig and things like that. And uh, coming to the end now, but I must talk to you about health and safety. So when you are collecting at the beach, a uh, key thing is to check tide times because the tide changes all the time. The tide times are never the same and tides can come in faster and higher depending on the day that you go. So you should always plan your trip in advance and find out the highs and lows of the tides so, and uh, make sure that you go when the tide is receding and make sure you know what time you need to be back by so you don't get trapped anywhere on the beach. Also, it's very important not to collect too close to cliffs because rock falls can happen at any time. There's rarely any warning and you don't want to be next to a cliff whilst that happens. It's also very good to look for overhangs and to avoid them completely. Uh, also, it is recommended to wear a hard hat if you're anywhere near the cliffs. So um, especially, for example, when you're jet jetting, so in Whitby, uh, wear a hard hat because the cliffs there are made from shale. And that's just flaky. Um, very flaky rock so that can just help protect you in case anything small falls down. Uh, you're not allowed to hammer into cliff faces and it's not recommended to do so either because you can um, compromise the stability of the rock faces and also it's more responsible as collectors to allow the natural process of um, weathering to take the minerals out of the rock for us. And also, uh, especially if you're at the beach, watch out for any slippery rocks because uh, the rounded rocks can be very slippery, especially if they have any seaweed on them. And also mudstone can be really slippy as well when wet. Here's a mudstone here from when we were collecting fossils in Somerset. Mudstone becomes, it's like an ice rink once it's wet. And also if it's really saturated, you can get stuck in the mud as well because it comes almost like a gloopy liquid. So do be very, very careful of that. 
Other foster king safety, I do suggest something which I call the buddy system. Uh, I like to go foster king with someone else all the time. This is so that if anything happens to me, I've got someone directly there that can help. Um, sometimes this is less important, for example, if you are just beach combing. However, I still would recommend that you always tell someone at home where you're going and what time they can expect you back. This is really important, even if you're just along the beach because of the tides. Um, so that way, someone else that's not there is looking out for you and you give them a call as soon as you're in a safe spot or with signal. Um, so that you can uh, let them know that you're okay. So the buddy system is highly recommended all the time. Always watch out for any loose rocks if you are scrambling around mine dumps. And on that note, you should always uh, work separately from one another. So do not work directly on top of one another because the person on top could slip or fall, um, which then affects both of you if someone is working beneath you. Or also loose rocks could come down and affect the other person. So always make sure that you work with a space between you. Uh, when it comes to any mining zones that might have underground mines, it is advisable not to enter any adits or shafts. So adits are the tunnels that are access points or that were drainage systems that allow you into the inner workings of the mines. Uh, shafts, often vertical shafts, which um, were access points to the ore as well. Uh, we recommend uh, staying well away from these. Uh, mainly because, you, especially if you're inexperienced, you don't know what's in there. Um, often there can be false floors within tunnels and within drifts, and that's where the ore might have been mined down from where the adit is. So you mine down and then they put a floor to cover that area again. This is typically made from wood. The wood's been there a couple of hundred years. It can be very dangerous. There can also be sudden shafts dropping down as well. So um, do not enter any adits or shafts and don't throw things down shafts either. Because Some people do explore them. So you don't want to put them at risk if there is anyone exploring in any of these shafts. It's also important to say that some mines depends what they were mining. So for, for example, coal mines, they can actually have areas of dead air and also some toxic gases in there as well. So that's another reason you should not go in. And uh, one last thing, it's always good, especially if you're in an area which did have a lot of active underground mining, you want to avoid any depressions when you're walking around the cliff sides um, or anywhere really around, <clears throat> around the um, landscape because depressions might indicate, not always, but they might indicate a possible vertical shaft that's below and it might have been infilled. Either way, very, very dangerous to walk on top of them. Some of these have been covered, a lot of them haven't because there are literally thousands. So therefore, if you ever see a depression, especially if it's just a couple of meters to several meters wide, a sudden depression in the landscape is best to always walk around it. And last but not least, do wear the appropriate protective equipment. So hard hat, goggles and gloves. And now the last part of the presentation, how do you identify your stones? Well, this is a bit like gemology, really. It comes with experience, but some helpful tips that can help you out. Uh, one is to know uh, what minerals can be found in the area that you are gem hunting in, because if you have a known reference list of minerals that are there, then you can do a comparison on which one that you might have. Um, then often it will come with experience and study. So just like gemstones, once you've seen it once, you can often identify it the second time around. So uh, knowledge will come the more that you collect and the more that you see these unknown specimens. Also, if you're at a real loss, you can always ask mineral or gem forums, post a high clarity, high quality picture. And if someone knows the answer, they might be able to help you out with an identity. But do make sure the picture's of good quality. Uh, also, you could ask an expert. So um, if they do have the time and if they know the answer, they might be willing to help you out and guide you to the things that you might have. So this can also be local shops in areas where um, you're collecting, if they'll be kind enough to do so, or even people online if they have time and knowledge and if they're willing to help you out. Also something that you can try as well. But otherwise, that's it. That's the presentation. So thank you so much for watching this um, talk on the gemstones of the UK. Here, just to finish off, is another agate from Scotland, these beautiful white, orange and yellow colours.
So uh, these weekly sessions are winding down now. So I would just like to say a big thank you to everyone who's been watching. It's been great fun for me. It's been an absolute pleasure. So I do hope that you've enjoyed these sessions. I hope to see you also at some point in the future. So do take care of yourself. Have a great rest of your summer and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.